We also, if they conform, confirmed by anything in history or today by sciences. Fourth, ha less ad hoc. We use less non-evidence assumptions. We are in a better position than using such arguments that lack any evidence. And five, illumination. A hypothesis can provide good solutions to historical problems, and if this is the position, it strengthens one case. One's case. Page 109 to 111, The Resurrection of Jesus, Mike Lacona, A New Historical Approach, IVP 2010. Uh, in the paper, uh, a roundtable discussion with Mike Lycona on the resurrection of Jesus. He says, when conducting authentic historical investigation, one cannot presuppose that the source with which we are working are ignorant or divinely inspired. Otherwise, we would simply conclude everything reported in those sources is true and wrap up the investigation. A theologian can do that when studying Jesus. A historian does not have that luxury. Theology and history are different disciplines with different objectives and approaches. Now I believe that everything in the Bible is true, but that's a statement of faith and has to be argued by reason of a different sort. My object in the book was to see what I could prove concerning Jesus' resurrection with reasonable and adequate historical certainty apart from any faith commitment. My approach is a little bit nuanced than Lycona. I recognize actually in ancient historiography and in present historiography there is always theological reflection. The historian has ever written in history without putting their interpretation. Interpretation is theological reflection. It is a theological, it is not historical. So you cannot have history without information and facts and interpretation. It is not possible. So I would disagree a little bit with my friend Mike Lacona, not, not my friend personally, but a, a man who I greatly respect. What I would say is that we all, whether skeptic or not, all are influenced by our biases, but that we can look at historical facts and come to some objective understanding, but we have to recognize that our presuppositions will be there and influence our interpretation. You can never completely get away from presuppositions. You can never completely get to the facts without being influenced by presuppositions. But at the same time, we can look at reality of the facts. They are there, facts are facts. But there is a tension, there is an interplay between facts and presuppositions. So my position is much more nuanced and much more subtle than Mike Lacona's. But we have a criteria that the secular historians use and we use that in our historical di discussion. The next, we build on the facts that we already know. Dr. E.P. Sanders as noted, has noted a number of facts facts that the scholarly world generally agree with. Now what the atheists do not tell you, what the secular scholars do not tell you who are anti-Christianity they do not tell you that the vast majority of these scholars who write on the resurrection, like Dr. Carrier, Bill Doherty, David Fitzgerald, Robert, Dr. Robert Price, all these skeptics reject the main body of facts that the academic world already acknowledges. E.P. Sanders said, gives these facts. Number one, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Number two, Jesus was a Galilean he preached and did healings. Number three, Jesus had 12 disciples according to him. Number four, Jesus did his work for Israel. Number five, Jesus was controversial at the temple. Six, Jesus was crucified outside Jerusalem by Roman authorities after his death. Jesus followed as a movement. 
And finally, a group of Jews persecuted at least part of the New Cup movement, Galatians chapter 1, 13, 22, Philippians 3, 6. The persecution continued up to the end of Paul's career, 2 Corinthians 11, 24, Galatians 5, 11, 6, 12, Matthew 23, 34, E.P. Sanders 1985, Jesus and Jude Judaism, uh, Philadelphia Fortress Press. And just a little aside, notice how I'm using a wide variety of scholars. Notice how I'm interacting with a wider scholarly community. Virtually no atheist on the internet or even the atheist scholars will do what I've done in quoting such a wide variety of scholars and engage with them. So we've looked at presuppositions, we've looked at methodology. And now let's just look at some of the data, the evidence for the resurrection. Now, all what I've done and given to you today, I offered to debate Aaron Ra, and he ran away from a debate with me because he knew he couldn't be beat me in debate on this. I had a, a debate with DPR Jones. I beat him in debate. I only touched on the resurrection a little bit. I had a, a discussion with um, Ozzy on the historical aspects of Jesus. I had a discussion with Thunderfoot. But none of these atheists, none of these atheists in any way, in any way tackled my scholarship, my arguments, and what I had to say on the resurrection of Christ. No proper debates were provided for so that we could discuss this topic in a very scholarly, academic way. The atheist community completely and utterly run from these challenges for debates. Only recently, John McDropout challenged, uh, took on the challenge for a debate, and I would actually love to debate him. And I've said I would debate him, and given him, uh, I said to him that I would debate him. But when you have idiots ride into the city centre and try to film you, atheists, when you have that kind of pressure put on you with silly accusations and all that kind of stuff going on and people like John Mc drop out um, commentating on archive channels that are in the China uh, behavior then I'm not going to be willing to debate someone unless they make it clear that they disassociate themselves from that kind of culture but basically the atheist community the skeptical community has not, in any shape or form, in any way, dealt with the issues that I've just mentioned before we even get onto the evidence. They have not dealt with presuppositions. They have not dealt with methodology in any shape or form. The best that they can do is quote Earl Daugherty or a Richard Carrier 